Today's bonus episode features my full discussion with Professor Joan Waugh. Joan Waugh is a professor emeritus of history at UCLA. Professor Waugh has focused her research on the 19th century, especially the Civil War, Reconstruction, the Gilded Age, and President Grant. Our conversation was super interesting and offered great insight into the period. Without further ado, here is our conversation. My name is Joan Waugh. For the past 30 years, I've been a professor in the UCLA Department of History. I've been teaching the Civil War era and Reconstruction and Gilded Age policy to large numbers of undergraduate students at UCLA. It is also the focus of my scholarly work in, the, in of that era. era. I've published several books, co-edited others, and I find I, I really have been fascinated by history since I was a weird little girl and love to read books, especially about Lincoln. I very early on decided he was a, <clears throat> a great figure in American history, but also other people of the era that in the 19th century, I just didn't know what I was gonna do with it. And I have found that it is the most rewarding occupation anyone could have to read and write and think about and teach U.S. history. And I am right now, I, I've been retired for about a year and I plan on coming back and teaching at UCLA, but I've been very busy with projects, continuing my work on Ulysses S. Grant, uh, which is, and the Civil War. Uh, I've co-written a textbook recently and it's just, uh, um, I'm just very, busy and still remain very busy in in the era. That's great. Yeah, there's something about US history which is unique to kind of all other genres I've found. But um, so going into kind of the subject matter. Um, so, you know, following the Civil War, of course, is the era of reconstruction. So what kind of takes place in this time period? And what are kind of the key pieces of legislation that happens during Reconstruction? I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's quite wonderful that you're actually interested in the Reconstruction era because for, I think for most of the, uh, its history, the Civil War has been much more fascinating than the Reconstruction era, which was simply, uh, I think, the continuation of this fascinating and troubled period in our history. The Reconstruction era is essentially how was the United States gonna put itself back together? How was the victorious union going to reincorporate the 11 seceded Southern states? And debates over the nature of that reunion roiled the country for, for 14 years, I would say, until we can, it, it didn't, it didn't stop the controversy about Southern versus Northern and about Black versus White. But in 1876, some kind of reconciliation was achieved. And I think that uh, the, 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 peace, uh, the peacetime included uh, how to physically restore and rebuild the ruined South, because we have to remember the South was in the country was in was desolate and destroyed great swaths of the Confederate states. Uh, how how to do that, but also how to reintegrate a mass of embittered white people, uh, while reevaluating the nature of citizenship for all, including the the freed people of the South, the three million. So that that was a huge challenge. And it was a challenge that faced Abraham Lincoln. It was a challenge that faced Andrew Johnson, who succeeded Abraham Lincoln when he was assassinated in 1864. And it certainly dominated the, uh, the two terms of the presidency of Ulysses S. Grant. And to say that it's, um, it's a mixed 
bag of results is to put it, uh, to put it quite mildly. And I don't know how you want me to uh, exactly, uh, you want me to, to go over the highlights or the lowlights or both. Yeah, yeah, you can you can cover you know both um, yeah. kind of the key moments. I mean, I think I think that um, one of the questions that I was that you sent me is a really good one. Was reconstruction a success or a failure? As Americans, we want we want this clear delineation, don't we? We don't want to deal evidently in our history with the c complex and convoluted and often contradictory mess that it was. And especially in the 21st century, we look back and we, we see what went wrong. We judge the past by our standards and we find it wanting. And I'm not sure historians should do that. I think historians should try and understand the people of the past, the events of the past. And yes, we can agree and disagree. And we would often disagree. We often disagree with how people Americans in the past acted and passed laws or didn't pass laws, but we still have to try and understand them. And I think my, my response to was, re, was reconstruction a success or failure to simply say this, it was a qualified success and a qualified failure. And if that's, if that's a little bit sleazy, I'm, I'm taking that road. <laughs> And what I mean by qualified success is that we have to understand as historians or, or just citizens studying the past that from the majority of Americans at the time, before the Civil War, during the Civil War, and after the Civil War, reunion was the most important thing. Why would, why, I mean, just, just read Lincoln's uh, speeches and his second emancipation address. And you find that there's still a desire, the desire is to save the union. And so that, that is something that if you understand that, even if you don't think it's the most important thing, you understand a lot of the rationale, a lot of the actions, a lot of the events that occurred between Republicans and Democrats during Reconstruction. And a lot, you understand a lot of Grant's actions. and. I would say to the second, it was a qualified failure because black rights were not secured by any means. We know that. And, and what happened after the Northern troops left and the Northern politicians left, reconstruction failed. It ended in essentially in 1876, as we know with the election of Republican Rutherford B. Hayes. The, um, what happened was um, African Americans were pretty much left on their own. And what happened was the Southern whites in instituted this segregationist policy called Jim Crow, which lasted into the 20th century. So that was, that was a huge failure. But on the other hand, if you look at it from that generation of, of Americans perspective and perhaps other generations, maybe up to the 21st century, it was a qualified uh, failure only because we, the union did stay together and the United States became the most powerful nation in the world with all that, the problems still that we see with that, it would have been quite different if the South, if, if the Confederates had established their nation. So I think we just have to look and, and just see that a lot of the past is muddy. It's not clear. Yeah, it, it's very nuanced issue. And, and I think, you know, we're still kind of struggling with that nuance today. Um, of course, as you know, history, history is, is, is in a straight line. Um, and, you know, we're still living through um, uh, events of the past um, and reactions to that. Um, but going into more of the um, grant administration kind of uh, still in the vein of reconstruction, but what, you know, what did the grant administration do, um, you know, to the tune of racial progress? Um, and, you know, where, where did they succeed in that? And what were their shortcomings? I think uh, th that is a great question. And I think that one of the, 
elements of the assessment of US Grant, his presidential and, and his overall reputation that has been uh, completely revised, at least by many historians, if it hasn't percolated to the general public as yet, that is that he was our first civil rights president in, a, in the most meaningful way that we have come to identify what a civil rights president would uh, uh, look like, a white civil rights president. And he, uh, I mean, I, I can just give you some of the legislation that was passed during his administration, but remember he came in in 1868 he was the only choice the Republican convention had for the president of the United States. There was no one else in the country that st stood as tall as U.S. Grant, soldier statesman of the Civil War and the Reconstruction era. And he clashed with Andrew Johnson. I, if you can imagine what people lived through during this time, the, the coming of the war, the destruction and upheaval of the Civil War, Union victory, yes, but then reconstruction and all, all the turmoil that took place against an assassination of Abraham Lincoln, the impeachment of Andrew Johnson, and then US Grant's election. And he was, I think you could consider him, Lincoln, a moderate uh, Republican <clears throat> when he came into office. He certainly supported uh, African-Americans' rights. Uh, and he he worked toward that in within Johnson administration, but I don't think we could consider him as radical as, for example, Henry Wilson, uh, or Charles Sumner, uh, uh, Thaddeus Stevens. However, he did support the Thirteenth and Fourteenth Amendment. In fact, the Fourteenth Amendment, the uh, Civil Rights Amendment, <clears throat> one of the Civil Rights Amendment, uh, was signed uh, right after he took office in 1868. But let's just go over that. The uh, US grant uh, supported the Civil Rights Act of 1866, the first and second Reconstruction Act, which threw out Andrew Johnson's reconstruction policies that were so favorable to white Southerners and replaced it with uh, military districts uh, dividing the Southern states up into military districts, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Um, and uh, with, the, uh, with the instructions, don't come back to us until you write a state contra, uh, constitution, which includes votes for suffrage and rights and protections for African-Americans. So he supported that. Uh, and, and in terms of his own administration, he signed off on the 15th Amendment, which was the uh, act, the, the amendment to in, res, remove all restrictions to suffrage uh, for African Americans. He also, he also passed in 18, uh, his urged Congress to pass, and it did pass the Force Acts. Now the Force Acts were, were uh, key in suppressing the Ku Klux Klan which came into power in the early, uh, early, along with many other white uh, supremacist groups in the South, in Southern states, especially Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, North and South Carolina, and, and, and Georgia. And in any case, he, he supported and urged the passage of the Force Acts. He authorized military troops to go down and deal with the election outrages that were happening. The Force Acts uh, under his administration, the administration of Ulysses S. Grant, established for the first time a Department of Justice. Its first secretary, Amos Ackerley, Ackerman, was a very, a very strong supporter of African-American rights. I mean, that was really extraordinary. Uh, and he also, um, he also uh, signed off on the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which was uh, dear to Charles Sumner's heart. Uh, Sumner passed away before he knew that it was secured in Congress, but Grant signed that. And, of, and we can't forget the 13th, uh, I mean, you know, the three amendments were just huge and Grant supported all of them, obviously the 13th, the 14th, but and the 15th, and tried to make 
the 15th of reality, all of them of reality in the South. Now, you, uh, there were other areas in which many don't know that Grant undertook as president. He, and he would be the first president, for example, to go to, vi to visit black congresses. Congresses, what I mean is just gatherings of African-Americans usually in, in Washington, DC to reach out, to appoint African-Americans to positions within the Republican party and within the White House. And, and that is something that doesn't mean, we don't know about it now, but it meant a lot at that time. And he was widely respected by such important African-American leaders as Frederick Douglass. And they appreciated that he did, he tried to do so much. He could only do so much though. And that's where we're gonna to get to, I know to the failures. And of course there were failures and shortcomings. I'm not sure that, that there could have been anything else he could do to avoid, avoid the collapse of the reconstruction govern, governments because the Northern voters, and this is key, Northern voters, Northern voters, as, uh, as you possibly know, uh, in the elections of 1866, decided not to offer black suffrage to in their states. There were, there were a number of Northern states that had it on their ballot in 1866. They voted and their voters decided not to. It was one of Andrew Johnson's great points that he made that why, why are you forcing this on the South, uh, black voting when you don't allow it in the North in most of the states. There were a few uh, New England states, about five, I think that allowed black voters. Of course, there weren't many African-Americans in those states. One of them was, was uh, Henry Wilson's state, as you probably know. So that is, um, the, the shortcomings were part of the larger national story I would say, especially from 1872 in Grant's second administration to 1876, that is when, for example, as his uh, first year began, the Great Depression of 1873 struck. And this depression of 1873 was the first of the, the uh, profoundly disruptive industrial depressions that we would face as a country in the late 19th century. And then of course, going into the 20th century, most famously, I think for most people remember in their history books, reading about the depression in the 1930s. But, but this was akin to that. And, and the Grant administration, here's the thing, you probably know that two term presidents usually have fairly successful first terms and lousy second terms. Grant did not escape history in that regard. And, and that is, um, that was shown uh, in the fact that all the, the civil rights advancements, the reconstruction governments, which were dominated by a Republican party that had no natural base in the South, except for African-Americans. This is what makes Reconstruction, which is really the first biracial experiment in governing in the whole world, uh, um, so problematical, is that the Republican Party, 80% uh, of the Republican Party in the South was made up of African Americans. And, and they had very little white support and that small amount of white support diminished as each year went on and each Southern state was recaptured by, you, you see this, this is recaptured by the Democratic Party. And why did this happen? Why did Grant allow it to happen? He struggled against it. He did send troops down until the very end in, in hot spots like Louisiana and other states, but this was increasingly unpopular with Northern voters who were concerned with other things now. That's just, it's just a fact, they, they were sick of it. It wasn't 
in the tradition at that time of the federal government to interfere with state elections. And so that became increasingly unpopular and there was a big change that the Republican party had successfully captured both houses of Congress for a, for a long time now during the war could count, could count on approval for the Republican president's initiatives. Now in 1874, that ended when the House of Representatives came under democratic control and the Democrats refused to, to uh, uh, fund the kind of initiatives that would bring racial equality to the South, secure racial equality. It was on the wane. And so Grant presided over the decline of reconstruction in, in that way. There's no doubt about it. So that was, you know, that was a, that was part of why I think the recon, uh, reconstruction is described as an unfinished revolution. But it's, it's problematical to me because it depends on, on how you look at, look at the reason most Americans went to war. And I'm referring to the United States, the, the people who supported the union, the vast majority of the population, in other words. Why, why did the loyal, uh, what did the loyal citizenry want out of the war? What they really wanted out of the war was the security of the United States going forward. And they wanted, I, I think, and supported for a while what was would be considered radical changes in the racial status in the South. But what they but by the end of Reconstruction, they just wanted to know that the South accepted defeat and and were not um, actively. I, I don't know what to, uh, how to describe this. We're not actively killing great numbers of, of blacks. And, and other than that, they just simply were exhausted. And it does, it's not fair, it's not right, it's outrageous, but that's what it was. Yeah, it's, you know, thinking about it, it's like, you know, the war started kind of as a quest to reunify and then it became more of a war to end slavery towards the end and then it seems like through reconstruction it kind of cycled back to ensuring that unification was going to last um, and kind of ensuring that you know the war was over and that the south accepted defeat as you said um it's so just, it's just uh, and as sorry for interrupting you but no. it, it's it's key to remember that the for the citizenry of at that time racial equality was not number one it's not like it is for us today and has been for quite a while. It, it just wasn't even, even uh, considered important. And so that's, but, but I mean, except for, except for a few like your Henry Wilson, who is a really remarkable person. I, I look forward to your, your work, uh, hearing your work on him. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's, striking reading things, especially even from the, you know, the, the fifth, the 1850s, um, and, and just kind of the, the view of, you know, Black Americans then, um, and, and you're seeing that evolve uh, is very interesting. Um, so kind of shifting uh, away from kind of this reconstruction uh, policy and more towards Grant um, and his administration in terms of kind of his scandals, um, you know, he's, he's often remembered for, you know, the, the Credit Mobilier um, incident. So if you want to kind of uh, review that and, and explain kind of what happened there. Okay. Well, first reality check. There, there has always been great corruption in the United States government and in business and the two intermix, even from the very beginning. Let's just talk about Alexander Hamilton, for example, and his issues. Um, the, uh, but yes, Grant had a lot of scandals because the economy, one of the reasons they were different on, uh, it, we look back on them and say, wow, they're huge. All these scandals, it's never happened before. Actually, the Buchanan administration had many scandals. Every administration had, had scandals, as I said, and I won't, uh, I'll focus on Grant. 
but there, there was a surge in the economy, the industrial, what we know is the rise of the industrial economy was, was appearing everywhere after the Civil War. It was energized by the Civil War, it already had roots in the early decades of the 19th century. And, and the thing is, all these corporations and all the money, the stock market, really just, just booming silver and gold and paper money, all the issues that were, were part of funding the war were uh, continued to bring some uh, uh, problemat have problematical aspects. And Grant was, his administration was in the middle of it. And he himself, I mean, one of the things that, um, one of the things that's interesting is, is that the country elected a soldier and not a statesman, although he was a statesman in many ways in terms of his experience with re, re, early reconstruction, because he was responsible for implementing Lincoln's reconstruction policies in, in great parts of the South. But he wasn't a politician in 1868. He was above all that. And that's why, that's why he was elected. In any case, that I'm, I'm not trying to get out of uh, answering your question. I'm just saying that there was a, a naive quality to him uh, when it came to his friends, and this was something that he that that was also true when in his younger days and during the war, where he would trust people, and they would turn out to uh, to be untrustworthy. But in terms of his so in terms of his scandals, I mean, he had, there, there was the, uh, there was Black Friday at the beginning of his administration in which, in which uh, uh, these corrupt financiers tried to, to um, uh, corner the gold market and, and, Grant, uh, and Grant exposed them, but it was very controversial. There was the custom house ring that he had in which, and so many presidents had this problem in the 19th century, certainly in the Gilded Age, where are the uh, main source, one of the main sources of income for the government what, were tariffs coming into the, the biggest port, New York City. So there was the New York ring and, and uh, Grant Associates became, uh, um, became enriched by that. And the, the uh, many, newspapers, especially Democratic run newspapers, uh, publicized that that wasn't a good look. He had he had the uh, uh, his sec personal secretary was somebody he brought with him from his military days. His name was Orville Babcock. He's known for many shady deal, his involvement in shady deals, including Grant's attempt to annex Santo Domingo which was kind of a crazy thing. But his idea was that, that it would be one day be another state and it would be a place where African-Americans could go and escape the racism that they were experiencing. It was, it was uh, to be unsuccessful and it was very unpopular and apparently at least Babcock was approved of profiting from uh, from his dealings with the Santa Domingos. There was also the whiskey ring in 1875 and uh, Orville Babcock was also involved in the whiskey ring in which, um, <clears throat> in which uh, officials, a state and federal officials were accused of, of selling uh, cheap whis whiskey. And so that was very controversial. And Grant actually uh, testified on Babcock's behalf because he didn't, he believed Babcock's uh, protestations of his innocence. Uh, historians are mixed on this, uh, but there's no denying that, that these, these scandals impacted his administration and his, his also his role in history, his, evaluation in history. So it, it became known as grantism. In other words, if it's corrupt and officials are profiting off their government posts, it's grantism. And that's what the Democrats uh, 
uh, used to, I think, to great effect. And it definitely was a reason why the Republicans lost the House in 1875, as well as weariness with, um, with the weariness with Reconstruction. It's, I mean, there is a lot of, of uh, accomplishments that Grant had in his first administration that uh, he, he forged a treaty with Great Britain over shipping and over issues in the Civil War. It was called the Washington Treaty. And, and he, he, the interesting thing, if you look at the latest scholarly work, particularly a historian named Charles Calhoun, who wrote a magnificent account of Grant's presidential administrations, Yes, there were many flaws like there are in anyone who's, who's um, been in uh, office for eight years, but he remained wildly popular. And, and so he, among Republicans, the Republicans were the majority party. So, that, so that's why he was reelected by such, uh, such a great uh, percentage. I mean, I know you wanna talk about the election in 1872 which was one of the most interesting elections uh, of our country's history that no one knows about. <laughs> but have, have I answered uh, your question sufficiently about uh, the scandals? Yeah, perfect, if, yes. If you look at the cartoons at the time, the Democrat, particularly Democratic newspapers cartoons, it was, they were vicious and they were vicious in the, in the uh, against everybody, but yes, that, that was part of being president. There right. was no, no happier man in the United States than Ulysses S. Grant when the mess uh, of the election of 1876 was finally mm. resolved. Right. Um, well, just one quick follow-up on, on a point you made um, uh, about the, the Santo Domingo situation. Um, obviously, Charles Sumner um, had a falling out with Grant over that. Um, was that was was Sumner's you know uh, rejection of that driven by that kind of desire to have Santo Domingo be a place for you know, African Americans to go um, to kind of seek you know almost like a recolonization effort? Was that the main drive behind the opposition? It, I, I I can say that Charles Sumner had an irrational hatred of Grant, in my view. In, in which Grant assumed that Sumner would support this. He invited Sumner over for a meeting at the White House and Sumner, and, and he was actually shocked that Sumner worked, you know, just said, no, I will not support this. He believed it was a boondoggle. He didn't think it would, it would solve the country's racial problems. And he's probably right about that. But he, uh, Charles Sumner, you'd think, would support Grant and his administration in some way. I mean, after all, they were Republicans, uh, but fellow Republicans, but he, he just, he just, okay. he sabotaged Grant every way he could, including on the Santo, Santo Domingo bill, which, which Grant probably, I mean, it, it was just clear that it was going nowhere, but he, it, Grant just really believed in it and pushed it probably further than he should have. But anyway, that's, I mean, the, Charles Sumner absolutely uh, was a thorn in Grant's side. And, and he just, if you know anything about Charles Sumner, you know that, that like every human being, he was made up of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And there were there are some very unattractive aspects to, to his actions and his policies. Yeah, um, certainly, and especially you know I'm going to focus a lot on the you know difference in dynamics between Sumner and, and Wilson um, and kind of how history has remembered them both. Um, so that's going to be another feature um, of the podcast, which I'm interested in getting into. Um, so the next question, which you uh, touched upon was the election of, of 1872. So if you want to kind of review why you find that so interesting um, and kind of why Grant uh, or why the Republicans um, might want to nominate uh, someone like Wilson to be his running mate there. 
Well, in 1872, it was it, uh, leading up to the election, there were a lot of disaffected, what we would call sort of the progressive wing of the Republican Party, led by Sumner, of course, and, and others. Uh, um, and so this is 1870, 1871, leading into 1872. And so that that's something I just want to uh, come back to and just say that if you just judge Grant by his first administration, it would be a resounding success. He had a successful foreign policy. The economy was going great guns. As you know, that means everything. The, um, he, had, he and his administration passed some important bills and he was re-elected with 55.6% of the popular vote. So that, that is, uh, and, and a great electoral college victory. So he was going into it strong, but this wing of the Republican party called liberal Republicans um, and certainly led by Charles Sumner and other, and, and other liberal Republicans were very disaffected. One of the great issues at the time was, believe it or not, for former abolitionists was, was good government, civil service reform, we call it. And Grant, Grant's problems with corruption, they saw as, as devastating to the body politic. And that was their issue, civil service reform. And so they, the liberal Republicans broke off from the Republicans, held their own convention at the same time that the Democrats were holding their convention. The liberal Republicans nominated the the publisher of the New York Tribune, Horace Greeley, for their presidential candidate. And the Democrats supported him too. So you had this 1872 election with Horace Greeley and Grant and, and uh, Grant, uh, Grant uh, changed his vice president to Henry Wilson. So you had Grant and Henry Wilson running against Horace Greeley, and they, they just, they lost badly. So that, that was an interesting feature of the, of the campaign. It didn't stop Charles Sumner from trying to undermine the Grant administration in every way he could, but it was, it was a great disappointment. But their issue was clean government preserves democracy. And it's just in this, as essential to, and, and I, of course we can all agree with that, but uh, in any case, cl clean and honest and efficient government did not win the day in 1872. Let's just put it that way. And Horace Greeley was not a great candidate um, to put up against U.S. Grant. So he, he won election easily. And the addition of Henry Wilson, I, I don't know if you want me just, I, I mean, I have always admired Henry Wilson and I'm, I can. I hope you help to change this, but I'm always astonished that this generation in the 21st century know nothing about Henry Wilson. You you get crickets when you talk about Henry Wilson, and yet he is he's just one of the most. I mean, given our standards today, he lives up to those standards. <laughs> and and so, so anyway, I I just think that that his whole I mean, his whole background echoes uh, that of so many Americans at the time, including someone like Abraham Lincoln, where he, he's born dirt poor in New Hampshire from a working class family. He, Henry Wilson worked as a laborer, as a child laborer, as so many did. Uh, and, and I, you know, I think he worked as uh, in the shoemaking industry in, in New Hampshire, and then he became a shoemaking manufacturer when he moved to Massachusetts and he became really successful, but he never forgot where he came from and he never forgot the importance of labor and, and the, the rights that accrue from a decent labor, making a decent living uh, and working under decent working conditions. And I, and I think that's pretty amazing. And, and he's, he's just, um, as you know, became one of those sen senators who was very passionate 
in the 1840s and 1850s. Um, well, actually, he became senator when in 1850. 1855. 1855. But before, before that, he was a member of the House of Representatives of Massachusetts. Is that not correct? And then he, I mean, he just, he worked for uh, the abolition of slavery. And I think that's the key here as well, just to go back, what, what Northerners decided, the, the Union decided during the Civil War, we have to get rid of slavery. It's slavery that is that is the evil in this republic. Once we get rid of slavery, all of our problems will be solved. And for Henry Wilson and others like him, it was it was far beyond the abolition of slavery. It had come with equal rights and, <clears throat> excuse me, a fair uh, chance in life, like the the rest of the Americans supposedly had. So anyway, it's it's um, it, he had he just had a fascinating life. But I, as I'm sure you know, once he became vice president, he went the way of most vice presidents. He, he didn't do anything. <laughs> he wasn't asked to do anything because what did vice presidents do during this time? They just, you know, they, they just they gave speeches and maybe wrote some things. And, but Henry Wilson did not just sit back and twiddle his, his fingers and drink whiskey. No, he wrote a three volume history, didn't he? And I'm sure you're, you're gonna tell me about this, the history of the rise and fall of the slave power in America. And I mean, it, it, it's today, it's relevant. So that, that was, that's huge. I mean, he, he was really, really important to our history. Yeah, um, it, it's it's really fat. You know, of course, Wilson's whole life is is just fascinating. And I'm I'm actually from the same town that he lived in in Massachusetts. Um, that's kind of why I got connected with him. And yeah, um, Natick is that it? Yeah, Na it's pronounced Natick, um, but everyone calls it you know, Natick. Who doesn't know about it? <laughs> um, but it's you know it's interesting because even people in town don't know what he actually did, even though there's, you know, monuments and, and landmarks about him. Um, people just, you know, they think his vice presidency is really all he was. Um, and, you know, before I researched it, I, you know, that's what, that's what you go in assuming because it's, you know, a vice president, vice president, vice president, but really his, his bulk of his work was done as a senator. Um, yeah. right. so, as you know, he was the chairman of the Senate uh, Military Affairs Committee and as, I mean, was really active in promoting his vision of the war, you know, in working with other people, securing the support of the draft, for example, I think two drafts at, acts, and of course he the Emancipation uh, Proclamation. I, I mean, I would say, I, and you, you're the expert, so you tell me if you agree. He's probably not. He probably wasn't as radical as some of the radical Republicans. Would you agree with that? Um, I, I would say yes, and, and he seemed, he, um, one of his biographers termed him the, the practical radical. Um, he was pragmatic in his dealings, so he was willing to, you know, uh, give concessions in order to, you know, make the way of progress, I would say. I mean, he, he opposed the Black Codes, he, he opposed the, lim the, you know, erasure of civil rights and, and all that, and I think I think he I mean again he was one of the fathers if I may use that gendered word of the Freedmen's Bureau, and and that is that was a really it was it was just a really important moment in the history of the United States that a Freedmen's Bureau, a well you know this kind of agency for the welfare of refugees, but it mainly did its work in. Um, in among the freed men and women was it, that it was created really established some important things there. Yeah, yeah, it's it's there's just you know really everything in this period you can kind of trace back to Wilson having his hand in in some way. Um, it, it's just it really. Um, yeah. Could you just still hear me? I can. Okay, something just popped up and said my microphone. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, but, 
but I think, but I, I, I got you to admit that he wasn't the most radical of radical. And here he, he reflected, I think, a, a huge deep seated feeling among northerners that we just don't get today or we don't want to get. And that is, he, I mean, he didn't believe in confiscation of property uh, of the South. And I think that's something that, that a lot of today's critics, when they look back, they say, well, should have just confiscated all this Southern, the, the rebel property. He didn't believe in that. He believed like Lincoln, that you, um, we, we need to invite the embittered white, our former enemies back into the table and make them Americans again after they go through a process. And so he, he just, you know, he, he was very measured in that way. Yeah, you know, he was, he was personally friends with, you know, which is interesting. And after the war, he was kind of the biggest prom proponent to give Davis a pardon. Um, and, you know, Davis spent time in, in jail and Wilson was really um, one of the key people who visited him and, and wrote him letters and really pushed, pushed to get him, him, you know, forgiven. Um, but, you know, in, in, in his work in Congress, he was always pushing for, you know, the, the most you know politically savvy most constitutional way to get things done um so you know it's a mix of like personally he wanted every i would say that he and you know the most radical person had the same goals they just had different ways of going about getting them achieved yeah. which is interesting in itself and the dynamics that played out um so you know kind of the final thing i had here um was just like how how has he come up in your research you know do you remember when or, you know, how, I suppose you've kind of already answered this, but, you know, how often do you find Henry Wilson in your, in your reading and research of the war? Well, uh, I, I, to be honest with you, I haven't, um, I, the things that I've read on Henry Wilson, I mean, one of the, uh, I, I read many years ago when I was doing research on my, on my book on Grant, I became interested in him. Uh, but my book on Grant is a work of historical, I, I look at the memory of Grant and, but I did look at the administration, how it was remembered. And I was fascinated. I mean, I knew about Henry Wilson, his career before, but I, because I was writing on Grant's memoirs, I, I also wanted to write, read Henry Wilson's account of this period. And it was, I was amazed at how, relevant it was to today and how you know how that we think of the lost cause as overwhelming everything but no there, there was another voice there there were many other voices in the late 19th century and and yet the lost cause is remembered and its books and and speeches and not henry wilson which is is interesting to me uh, or and u.s grants reputation is often engulfed by a focus on corruption and drunkenness. You can't get away from that. And so that, and, and of course, Henry Wilson uh, came up, of, uh, I say of course, but that doesn't, that's meaningless. My early work was at, as a woman's historian. And my first book was on uh, a biographical study of a woman who led charity movements and, and politic, political reform movements in the late 19th century. And, and part of that was suffrage for women. And he was a supporter of women's suffrage. And that was, that's also something that, that we don't know so much about him. But, I, but as far as influence on policy. I think he was frustrated during the second part of the Grant administration that he didn't have very much, but there was no role for a vice president there. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of times that Grant kind of just didn't even listen to what Wilson had to say um, when, you know, some of the advice that he was being given from Wilson would have helped him out in certain aspects of, you know, whether it be public opinion and, and, generally how to get things done, but, um, you know, he was ignored. 
um, unfortunately. Um, and I think, you know, had Wilson not died um, and had he been in good health um, and become president, you know, how that entire 76 election would have played out in the lasting effect of the country would have been much different. Um, of course, you know, there's so many dynamics to look at in speculative history, but, but I think that's, it, it's, it's something that's very interesting. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a shortcoming of, of his life that he couldn't live a little bit longer to kind of see where the country would go um, and kind of be a voice in pushing for, you know, staying, staying on the goal of, of ending, you know, this, this kind of grip of, you know, the slave power as, as he dubbed it. Well, it, yes, I mean, uh, what ifs in history are fascinating and he certainly died too soon. However, I don't know. I mean, one of the, one of the aspects of this time, like today, the parties had different wings in them, right? Different, they were divided. The Republicans were divided between the progressive, what we would call the progressive wing, the radical Republicans, and the moderates and then the conservatives. And they were all speaking to different constituencies and based on their states. Uh, Charles Sumner never had to worry that he was too radical because he knew that he would be reelected in Massachusetts. And, but uh, Wilson, Wilson might have he might have made a run for it. Do you think did he talk about running for president or did he write about it? Or is no. that just you? <laughs> well, you know, I've 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 actually got gotten to speak with um Wilson's only living biographer, who's in his late 80s now. Um, and you know, he kind of speculated on that, saying it was it it he was a very popular politician and very well known at the time. So, you know, in 76, he would have definitely been a contender um for the nomination. Um, of course, he, he was very ill in his final years, so it's, it's not likely he would have been up for the job, um, you know, but if the conditions were right, it, it's likely that he could have, he would have been nominated, um, especially after, you know, serving as vice president. Um, oh, absolutely. Well, the, th the key thing is to find a candidate that doesn't aff offend the most number of people. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and, you Which know, one we Go haven't ahead. been too good at recently. <laughs> yeah, no, I know it's it's been. Um, we're certainly living through an interesting period now as well. Um, yeah. and I see a lot of interesting parallels between now and then. Um, so you know, learning about history is, is really a reflection of today um, and the future. Um, and one more kind of final question I had about that, um, kind of in that same vein, is um, something that I'm planning on focusing on is kind of, and I mentioned this, how Sumner is is more remembered than Wilson. Um, and when, when I asked um, John Myers, who's, who's the Wilson's um, biographer, you know, why Sumner is so hotly cited in, in different books about being, you know, the, the radical Republican, kind of the symbol, the icon of that era and Wilson's forgotten when Wilson got so much more done than, than Sumner ever did. You know, he said that, you know, after the war in, in, in the 20th century, a lot of the historians were part of that kind of, they were Harvard men in, in, in from Yale and they were historians who were kind of a part of the, the aristocracy that Sumner was also from. And some of them kind of looked down upon Wilson because he had you know really risen from poverty. Um, and that wasn't something that they kind of wanted to highlight. They, they preferred to highlight their own sense. And do, do you think that's kind of accurate into, into how we generally write about history and read history? I would like to think that that wouldn't be accurate, but I, I, it resonates with me. I mean, I think that's a lot of, of the reason, the, the harshest critic of Grant, the Grant administration was Henry Adams. And Henry Adams just thought Grant was a Neanderthal. He was stupid, unlettered, he didn't go to Harvard. And I think, I think that your, um, your author, has uh, has really hit on a point, um, and and I think that it remains somewhat true today. Charles Sumner undoubtedly was a riveting character <laughs> in our history, and he was eloquent. He was educated, unlike most uh, of Americans at that time. He traveled widely in Europe. He could speak foreign languages, and he he uh, he thought he was the smartest man in the, any room that he walked into. He was arrogant, 
he was also he also uh, was on the right side of a lot of issues that we think are important today. And but but I I he Charles Sumner could never be elected president. Henry Wilson might have had a chance. Yeah, no, there's so many interesting dynamics um, that I come across and, and reflect. And I hope to, you know, look at more of that um, when I'm kind of in that final stage of the podcast. Um, but thank you so much. I really enjoyed the conversation today um, and hearing your insights and, and kind of getting a, a fresh perspective on this kind of era. is really interesting always. So thank you.